OK, thanks very much. And uh, <coughs> thanks, Danny, and everybody for the invitation to, to speak at this event. Um, so I'm, my name's Chris Harrison. I'm the Publishing Director for Humanities and Social Sciences. That's the, the Global Books Program at, uh, at Cambridge University Press. I've worked at the press for about um, 18 years, um, initially as an economics editor, and more recently um, looking after the Global Books Programme. Before that, I was uh, working at Pearson in textbook publishing, and before that, in a far-off galaxy, many, many years ago, I was a PhD student, like I guess many of you, and um, working on a thesis at the um, School of Oriental and African Studies on African history. And um, uh, as my funding was running out, I accidentally got a job in publishing and, and liked it. Um, but I still carried on with, with my research, and I was delighted that my dissertation actually got picked up by Cambridge University Press um, in their African Studies series. So I've got uh, some sense of the kind of uh, both of the um, you know the, the publishing scene from from both sides of the fence. Um, I'm very conscious that um, I'm speaking at a, as part of Open Access Week, and the, I think the program today is um, uh, some really interesting speakers uh, who are looking at some of the new and emerging. Um, their kind of models in the publishing um, industry and the academic scholarly communications uh, field. But I see my role um, this morning maybe as setting out maybe sort of the more kind of traditional publishing landscape, um, which will serve as kind of as, as a backdrop and a reference point, I think, for some of the, um, the, the talks that you'll be getting later today. And I be speaking on that traditional publishing landscape from the perspective of somebody who works at um, a very old and distinguished university press. Um, we're very proud at Cambridge University Press of being part of you know, one of the world's great um, research universities. Um, and you know, we um, see ourselves very much as being an integral part of the university. We work very closely with the university library team um, here and uh, faculties around the university. Um, and uh, we see ourselves very much as sort of sharing the same kind of mission and values uh, as, as the university. Uh, we're very old press, so hence sort of talking perspective of the traditional thing. It doesn't get much more traditional in one sense than Cambridge University Press, been around since 1534. I'm not too sure why it took us 50 years to publish our first book, but I'd <laughs> like to reassure anybody who is thinking of submitting a book proposal that these days we do do it a little bit quicker. Um, so we're very proud of that heritage, but um, I think these days we're also very proud of the sort of the, uh, the um, innovation that's going on at the press. And we're doing, there's a lot of really interesting stuff that we're doing, um, not just in open access, but in, in lots of other areas as well. So, um, but that's us, and as I say, we're part of a, a huge and kind of quite sort of uh, perplexing and fast-changing publishing um, landscape, and it is these figures, I think, from a couple of years ago, but just to give you some sense of scale of the amount of scholarly communication that's, kind of, that's going on and captured in sort of in traditional um, book and journal formats. There are over 20,000 scholarly journals, I mean, it's an astonishing number, um, um, across the um, arts and sciences, and each year they publish two million journal articles. There are some 200,000 books published each year. At the press, the, the department I, I work for, um, we publish about 1,200 uh, new books every year. So we publish sort of, um, about 0.5, no, one of the world's biggest university presses. We publish about 0.5% of the output of um, the uh, overall academic publishing industry. And it is, with, the, with those kind of numbers, there are kind of, there is quite a lot of, um, there's big money involved, particularly on the STM side. You see these uh, turnover estimated around $14 billion um, and an HNSS somewhat smaller but still nonetheless significant, uh, just under $2.5 billion. So in this landscape with all this activity, with all that kind of that money and uh, uh, all the different kind of needs and requirements, you'll see there are many, many different publishers and uh, they range in scale from the kind of the really huge um, uh, multinationals um, through to um, sort of smaller kind of niche and emerging publishers. Um, um, and one of the interesting things I think about the publishing industry is that the barriers to entry are kind of relatively low, so there is always room for experimentation. In a sense, that's, that's always has been the case. But anyway, in that um, uh, landscape of uh, 200,000 journal, uh, 2 million journal articles, 200,000 books, I think 
One of your big challenges, and this will be one of my kind of uh, messages and key themes of the day, is to ensure that somehow you can make your work um, discoverable and visible, to how that you can sort of stand out and make sure that people are aware of it, because there's an awful lot of stuff that's being published. Um, so to think about how you can always make sure that, that your work, that you kind of provide the sort of the, the tools, the, the, the aids to ensure that your work is discoverable, that it's visible, that it stands out. And, to, and I think it's really important, no matter whether you're talking about journal articles or books, to think about how you, how you do that. And I'll be talking a little bit more about some of those tips. So I'm going to be talking mainly about the, um, the, uh, the book scene. I will have a few slides at the end about, about journals, but there's a lot of uh, the basic principles in many ways are, are, are quite similar. But I thought I, to begin with, I would just sort of sketch out some who the main kind of players are in the, um, uh, in the scholarly communications landscape. And start off with um, uh, university presses. I think we all kind of recognise what a university press is. There are, I'm not too sure the exact number, but I guess there are probably well over 100 of them around the world. And um, some are big, some are, some are small. So our friends at Oxford, I think, are the largest um, university press, and then were next. And Oxford and Cambridge, by some order of magnitude, were quite a bit bigger than any of the other university presses. So I think Chicago is, is the next biggest, but Oxford and Cambridge are very significantly bigger than the, um, the, any of the other presses. So we all um, characterise ourselves, characterize ourselves as um, being um, kind of mission-driven uh, presses that you know, we see ourselves, as I said at the beginning, as part of the university, sharing its sort of its, its values and missions to kind of to help advance um, scholarship and, and learning, um, and we also have a, a legal status of not for profit, um, and this means kind of different things I think in uh, for different university presses. For Oxford and Cambridge, um, not for profit means doesn't mean that we're not interested in profit because the university expects us to be self-financing that we have to generate our own revenues to invest in our, in our future publishing. Um, and not just self-financing, but um, our parent universities, Cambridge here and, and Oxford, um, expect us actually every year to, to be a net contributor to university revenues. So we, you know, every year we, we, um, um, we donate quite substantial amounts of money to the universities. And that's very different to the North American University Press model where I think um, almost without exception, um, North American university presses are subsidised to a greater or lesser extent <coughs> by their parent university. So in terms of how uh, we make our publishing decisions, as a university press, as a mission-driven um, organisation that sort of shares the values of the, um, the university, our number one um, consideration is always the kind of the academic quality. We spend, and we'll talk a little bit more about that, a huge amount of time on um, quality assurance and peer review. So academic quality is, is uh, absolutely essential, but it's, a, it's a, a necessary but not sufficient reason for going ahead in publication. We do also have to look at um, the market and to be sure that we can actually make a return on books. So the university presses uh, stand in contrast to the commercial publishing houses, and I just uh, categorise these into three broad categories. There's the higher education, College publishers like my old uh, employers Pearson, and they're publishing educational learning materials, incre increasingly in digital format, for very kind of big, you know, kind of introductory um, courses. There are a series of professional publishers catering for the needs of you know specific kind of practitioner communities, particularly in medicine, law, engineering. And then there's a group of publishers that I think uh, occupy a very similar space to us. Um, publishers such as Taylor and Francis, Palgrave, Edward Elgar who uh, are also publishing for the academic market, but um, are nonetheless kind of uh, for profit, and therefore have to look at the world in a slightly different way to the way that, that we do. All of these publishers, all very good, they all have very professional high standards. That said, the, the landscape is changing very, very fast, and we're hearing more about that today. So obviously for some time, technology has been a big driver of, um, of change. The journals business for a long time has essentially been a digital business. Um, the books business um, is increasingly going digital. Over 30% of uh, academic book revenues at Cambridge University Press now are, are from digital. And that means not just sort of kind of digital like Kindle that we associate, but increasingly libraries have a preference to acquire new content in, in digital formats. 
Open access, the theme of this week, has been uh, you know, kind of huge changes, particularly in the STM journals business. And there's some interesting experiments, I think, in OA in books, and um, I know we'll be hearing about some of those later on today. And at Cambridge, we ourselves are participating sort of actively and enthusiastically in, in some of those experiments, but it's quite a small percentage of, of really of our overall activity. So new formats, I think we're hearing uh, you know, the role of social media, blogging, um, and so forth. We ourselves are launching a new hybrid uh, books and journals format that I'll be talking about on, on Friday as a, a digital first um, publication. Um, there's been a whole growth of scholarly collaboration networks which are transforming not just the research space but I think also the, um, the publishing space. And all this is happening increasingly in a culture and an atmosphere where there's loads and loads of free stuff. And some of that free stuff is legal and some of it is, is illegal. But whether it's legal or illegal, it's kind of shaping kind of the culture and the expectations of, of people and the, how they expect to kind of to acquire and read content. So I'll talk a little bit about publishing with Cambridge. Um, but basically, this I could cross out Cambridge and say Oxford or Princeton or whatever. This is the, these basic rules. Um, apply pretty much across the board in, in the university press um, sphere. So at Cambridge, we're interested um, in a broad range of um, types of books. Very important part of our activity, particularly in humanities and social sciences, is research monographs. So we're interested in kind of world-class research that we think makes an original and significant contribution to the literature. And we kind of stress the original and significant contribution quite highly. It's really important for us that, uh, that we do that. We're also interested in um, uh, surveys and reviews of kind of key topics which I think are, um, be useful for advanced undergraduates. Uh, upper level textbooks, graduate textbooks, reference products like kind of Cambridge histories, Cambridge handbooks, and as I say in colleagues in medicine and engineering do practitioner guides. I'm assuming that most of the people in this room are probably most interested in our activities in sort of the, our first biggest category, research monographs. So I'm going to talk a little bit about, um, you know, kind of just tips about how to sort of submit and think about uh, a research monograph proposal. And both in books world and the journal world, I can't sort of stress highly enough the importance of doing your homework, asking colleagues, friends, peer groups about, you know, kind of, uh, for their experiences of working with uh, different publishers, journals, who do you think, which publishers um, have got lists which are most closely aligned to your own research interests. If you're kind of working um, at Cambridge University, don't just think of Cambridge University Press as, as a publisher. If we, don't, if we don't publish in your field, then actually we're probably not the most appropriate publisher for you. So it's really important that you look around to find out who are the most, um, who's publishing actively in your field. Go onto those publishers' websites, research and um, find the names of the acquisitions editor, the commissioning editors of the people in that field, and write them a personal email. It's always best to, to write to me as Chris Harrison at Cambridge University Press rather than as dear, Chris, dear Cambridge University Press or dear economics editor. Um, make sure it's um, personal, take care over it. It's possible and it's quite acceptable in the books world, unlike in the journals world, to submit to multiple publishers at the same time. But if you're writing to Cambridge University Press, make sure that you've adapted your letter that you're also writing to Oxford University Press. I mean, I get a lot of, um, we get a lot of emails and, and letters saying how thrilled they would be to publish, have their book accepted by Oxford University Press. Um, and that's just because they're kind of quite rightly and quite understand understandably submitting to, to both publishers that haven't sort of taken the care to, um, you know, to, to adapt it um, properly. Don't assume that we're experts. You know, we're all kind of, as the commissioning editors, you know, we're all kind of uh, graduates, we're kind of relatively intelligent people, but we're not, you know, kind of, we're not as clued up in the subject areas as you are. So talk to us as if you were talking to um, um, a more kind of general layperson um, and to really kind of highlight what's important and significant in your work in kind of words and language that we'll understand. Don't send us a full manuscript, send us a book prospectus. <coughs> so a book prospectus, um, is a kind of, again, it's a, it's a useful discipline to go through and it'll help you think about how your book is going to, um, to think more clearly about your book. First of all, give uh, your work a clear and descriptive title. Don't try and be clever. There's an awful lot of sort of clever academic puns you see in journal articles and, and book titles. And within the in crowd, they're quite smart and we have a chuckle, but actually in the wider world, trying to you know, kind of make yourself discoverable, think about that yellow um, daffodil there. Um, it's actually that they're, they're 
they're difficult. Those, those puns aren't going to get recognized by um, search engines. Um, so really kind of have kind of keywords, clear descriptive titles, have a very short summary of the aims and scope of what you're trying to do, and as I said, uh, emphasizing why you think you're making a distinctive original contribution. Give us a detailed uh, table of contents with some kind of abstracts of what you think you're going to be writing about in each chapter. And something which I've always encouraged, particularly when I was working in economics, was to um, um, get you to ask uh, authors to give an indicative list of the sort of literature that they will be citing in each chapter. Because that's a very useful kind of shorthand way of getting, giving referees a, um, some sense of what the book's going to be about. Um, talk about your target readership. Don't feel obliged to kind of to sell your book as being something that's going to be of interest to everybody. If you're really targeting, you know, kind of 18th century literature scholars, that's fine. That's 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 we really kind of really happy to know that. Um, and then we'd also just like you to like to know, get your sense of how your book relates to the literature. A brief sense of who you are. A short autobiography. We don't need your full academic CV. And if you have them, it's really great to have some sample chapters. And we're happy to kind of make an initial. Um, decision based on um, that kind of prospectus, yeah. Um, many of you will be thinking about turning a dissertation into a book. Uh, great things about dissertations, um, there's a thorough review of previous scholarship. We know that you're the world's expert in that field, but typically most dissertations are too narrow to actually kind of to work as a kind of a full-length book um, um, treatment. So uh, our standard default advice is always to kind of to think first of all about kind of mining your dissertation for, for journal articles. You can test that and you can broaden, um, broaden the field, broaden your, your approach. Um, when you are coming back to thinking about turning that dissertation into a book, there's a whole lot of stuff you have to do for your PhD examiners in terms of making sure that you know, you've, uh, your literature review is very complete, your methodology is sort of is very clearly stated, but those aren't of as of great interest to um, your kind of book readers. So get rid of those. Think more about how you can actually kind of make the book broader in scope, make it maybe more comparative, wider historical time frame. And think about all those things before you start to talk to a publisher. So let publishers know that you're actually aware that your dissertation won't necessarily turn into a, a word for word into a book. The review process, we have uh, two main stages. There's a desk review, so the, your prospectus gets to the, lands on the, ed the editor's desk. Um, they will make an initial decision as whether they think it's something that fits their list. If it does, they'll send it out for peer review. If it doesn't, we will kind of decline at that stage. Um, there's quite a high rejection rate at that stage. If we do then send out to peer review, um, we may sometimes ask you to send the full manuscript in, and we may be happy to work with prospectus and sample chapters. Our peer review process, very similar to journals, um, single blind, um, typically we'll get uh, two or three uh, reviews per project, sometimes more. Our outcomes will be kind of uh, decline, accept, or very commonly revise and resubmit. It's very hard work from the editor's point of view. By this stage, we've invested quite a lot of work, uh, time in the project. Um, each year, I think at Cambridge, we commission about 4,000 uh, referee reports. It's hard work for referees, particularly you know, book referees reading a full manuscript. Uh, we've got a lot of work to do, and we recognize that by paying, um, giving them book credits or, or cash payments. I think there are some differences between book and journal um, peer review process. I think in the book process, we kind of see peer review as being as much a mentoring process to help the, the author develop and shape the book. By this stage, we've already invested quite a lot of time and effort. We're kind of, we're, in a sense, we're looking for reasons to say yes. Um, um, so we're really wanting to try and uh, to help you, and we're also wanting to build a relationship which we think is going to last throughout your academic right, life. Whereas I think in journal, uh, journal peer review, it's maybe more of a, a gatekeeper. You know, they have far too many submissions. Um, they have to be able to pick out sort of the five percent to be accepted. Um, so for book reviewing, obviously, it's a more challenging task I think than journal reviewing because um, you know it's, it's a, uh, there's more content. Typically, it's quite often be interdisciplinary. Um, one book I'd really recommend, I'm sure it's here in the university library, it's called Rejected, um, and it's um, a book collecting, I think it's mainly works of um, economists who had their, in some cases, articles for which they were to then to go on and win the Nobel Prize, rejected by uh, a ton of, uh, journal, um, of journals. Um, and it's got some really interesting kind of thoughts about the peer review process, and I think it's sort of quite encouraging sort of, you know, kind of, um, to, to make sure that, realize that you're, kind of, you're not alone if you do get uh, turned away at that first stage. 
In terms of responding to, to referee comments, I'd say be respectful, understand they've invested a lot of time, don't say these people are idiots, they haven't understood your work, but engage constructively, um, you know, kind of and uh, politely um, with their work, with, what with their comments, but don't be afraid to disagree with them as well. So when you go right back to the, um, the, the book editor, say these are comments I agree with, but with greatest respect, these I, these I disagree with, and I, you know, I stand, by, stand by what I've said. And I really respect kind of a, a good, strong, kind of robust defense of somebody's um, work. Um, I'm not going to skip this process. So at Cambridge, we have basically we have an internal uh, review meeting, which is um, editorial sales and marketing. And when we're all happy with everything, it then goes to the press syndicate. So this is a meeting which uh, meets fortnightly during the academic term. Um, and they see every single project we do, they see all the referee reports, all the projects, and it's only once they've accepted something that we can then offer a contract. And that's the same for everybody. It's a very democratic process, and whether you're a kind of a first-time author, postdoc, or whether you've won the Nobel Prize, you go through the same process. Um, I think I'm going to stop there, because I'm actually going to run out of time. But um, um, anybody have any questions? And these, these slides will be shared, and I will be around after um, during the tea break as well. So. Sure. Okay, well, um, most of our open access, so, so the question was to talk a little, uh, to say a little bit more about um, CUP's um, involvement and uh, activity in the OA space, um, and then a very specific question about the scope for a, a different type of relationship between the press and uh, individual university departments, um, which would be sort of a hybrid with the university, um, with, with the department taking responsibility for uh, creating an open access version of um, scholarly content properly vetted with quality control and then the press getting involved in maybe kind of a global distribution of a, of a, of a print version of that through print on demand. So open access is we have an open access department. As I say, most of what we're doing is um, in, in the journals field and most of it is in, in STM. Um, but that's... Um, um, and that's just the way the kind of the open access world, world is, I think. And, um, but on the, the, the book side where I work, um, we are working very closely with uh, the uh, consortia such as like Knowledge Unlatched, and we're kind of participating actively in, in those experiments. And um, they're interesting ones, and we're kind of we're learning from them. So Knowledge Unlatched um, is a, um, a model with a cons consortium of libraries, which guarantee presses a... Um, a certain minimum income, um, and we make our uh, the, the book content available um, free in digital format, and then we're also free to 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 publish print versions. And it's been interesting to see how how that's gone, um, how that's working. But it's kind of a, quite a small part of our activity, and the the scale of it is limited to a certain extent by the the funds that Knowledge Unlatched are able to to raise. Um, we do also have a published. Um, um, policies on uh, both on um, green and um, gold open access. So we have a, you know, f um, APCs for article or book publishing charges for publishing a book monograph as, um, uh, as open access. Um, and we are publishing an increasing number of, uh, of monographs. 
as open access with the, the, the open access charge funded by the author's um, research body or parent university. And we're also doing some ex uh, just completely uh, experiments of our own, just publishing, waiving all fees and just sort of seeing what happens if we put interesting content out there um, in digital format and um, also publishing a print version. So um, a couple of years ago, many of you, possibly the historians amongst you, will maybe recognise the History Manifesto which we, we published, uh, which was completely free but which uh, we also sold in print format and there were several thousand um, sales of that. So we're experimenting and to come to your second question around the, the scope for that kind of relationship, I think it's something which we kind of, uh, you know, would be interesting to talk about more. It's not dissimilar to relationships we, which we've had in the past in the pre-digital, pre-open access world with some universities. We published some series with the, I know in the economics department, we published a series of uh, on, on commission which went through a slightly different process. We have similar series with the classics department. Um, I think we always have to look at sort of the, you know, the, the bigger picture as well of the overall kind of scale, sustainability, opportunity costs on, on all sides. But certainly it's, those are the kind of relationships and I think with the technology and the way in which new business models that we should be looking at and would be interested to talk about more. Thanks. Excellent. Thank you very much, Chris. Um, right. So, would you like to thank Chris?